Hi, thanks for joining us. Welcome to Pathways to Progress. I'm your host, Lisa Savage, and I told you we'd have a surprise this month. I'm here with City Councilor Victoria Pelletier, as uh, always, but Councilor April Fournier has joined us this week, this month. <laughs> so thank you for coming and making time to do this. Oh, it's going to be fun to be in a conversation with uh, new perspectives yes. and um, a lot of the things that Councillor Pelletier has told us, you can debunk some of that. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to introduce yourself to the audience a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm April Fournier. I use she, her pronouns. I am Diné, or citizen of the Navajo Nation, um, but an at-large councillor here in Portland, Maine. Um, I'm a mom. Uh, I am a former early childhood special education teacher. Um, I play roller derby um, and I like music and karaoke and also trying to figure out how we get more representation for our community and how we make sure that all voices that are impacted are part of every conversation that we have um, and making sure that when we say democracy, we really mean it. And also, this is not your first term on the council, right? You were re-elected. Correct. Yeah, right? my uh, first term was back in um, 2020 and then was just re-elected this last fall. Great. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Thank Portland's you. lucky to have you. Oh, thanks. So it. we basically discuss what the work of the city council has been, including sure. committee work um, in the last month or other issues that have arisen. I know there's been some exciting developments about housing, mm -hmm. but maybe let's check in with Councillor Pelletier before we plunge into that. And then mm -hmm. I have another surprise for everyone a little later in the show, so stay tuned for that. I can't wait for the surprise. Uh, I'm good, I'm here. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely, um, it's an interesting time between now, I think in March and city council, it feels like a little bit of a lull because we're just starting to talk about the budget. We haven't had a meeting or public comment on it yet, although we're receiving it via email. It just feels like the calm before the storm a little bit. Like we, I think everyone's coming off of the holidays. We're getting back into the swing of things. We're starting to have committee meetings more regularly. And it's like, we're getting ready for what I know will be a really busy, um, you know, spring and, and definitely summer and fall. So uh, it's been a, very slow start to the year, but I think that that's good because we were so packed all the time last year and we had a really busy summer. We had a lot of things that we were navigating specifically around the encampments and around our unhoused community. So um, going now into 2024, I think with a new council as well, welcoming a couple of new members, new mayor, um, I think that we are trying to still navigate like how we all work together now in, in this a similar but different environment. So. Yeah, it's been it's been a um, a good start. Great, and Councillor Fournier, I think you're the chair of the House and Human Services. I mean, the Health and Human Services Committee for the yes. City of Portland. Yeah, I am. What this does is, that role entail? Um, so this is my second year being chair of Health and Human Services. Prior to that, I was chair of the Legislative and Nominating Committee. Um, and so as chair, you're working with city staff. So because we're health and human services and public safety, um, we work with the police chief, the fire chief, uh, as well as the director of health and human services, um, which right now we have an interim director, the former director, uh, Kristen Dow, um, left uh, at the end of last year uh, for another position. And so we have an interim in that position, which is challenging because of course, it's one of the busiest and most important um, departments that the city has. But as the chair, you're meeting with staff, so those leaders as staff, to really talk about what are some of the staff priorities that are coming forward, and then of course working with your fellow counselors that are on the committee for what are their priorities. And we like to try and finish our work by the end of the year, and that doesn't always happen, and sometimes there's some carryover that you then put on your um, agenda for the next year, but it's really just listening to what is the community saying for feedback and what are some of the important issues that they have? What are the things that are personally important to us? And then what, you know, what comes up for staff? So we try and keep a little bit of space to be flexible because mm -hmm. things change. Um, so like, for example, last year when we were building our agenda, we knew in March there would be the HSC opening or the Homeless Services Center. And so really making sure that we understood what does the opening plan look like? Have you thought about things like transportation? Have you made sure that we have storage for belongings? Uh, and also working with community partners to say, this is what we're hearing from staff. What is your experience? And then trying to really 
weave all of that together to make sure that whatever policy we're putting forward um, as a council or whatever decisions we're making are really inclusive of these multiple perspectives. Um, but then, of course, you chair the meeting um, that we have each month. Um, we do the agenda setting um, and then just kind of the follow up to make sure that all of the committee members feel like they're well informed and they know what's coming and then connecting with the other counselors to make sure that they know what's coming. So it is definitely a little bit of a busier role as a chair, but um, I have a really great committee that works really well and um, is very informative. So I think um, I have it, I don't wanna say easy, but <laughs> it's definitely, it's not um, super difficult to work with my colleagues. So that makes it a lot easier. It's nice. I know that city staff and counselors don't always have the same priorities or agenda, right. especially right. about health and human services. Um, sure. So that can be tricky, I would imagine. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I've done um, in, in my life prior to the work that I do now um, for my day job is I worked in special education. And so one of the things that you have to do, um, I was a case manager or um, a individual education program administrator for early childhood. And so you had to hold meetings to decide services for children with special needs. And part of that is negotiating what is free appropriate public education and what is necessary services to help children advance um, you know, for, for whatever needs they have. And so a lot of that is, you know, there's only so much money and only so many services and only so many providers that can do that. But you're negotiating between parents and providers and then, you know, the education system itself. So I think a lot of the kind of the the negotiation, trying to find common ground, trying to figure out where we have tension points and where we have agreement points so that we can start to move things forward. And so I think the the, the previous life that I had prepared, prepared me well you. for to be able to yeah. kind of sit in this role, you know, and I think as a mom, I'm a mom of adults and teenagers, so there is negotiation that happens <laughs> all the time. That's the best case yeah, scenario. Yeah, in the best case scenario, <laughs> yes. So, uh, <clears throat> Councilor Pelletier, some exciting things have been happening in housing. Uh, opportunities, potential here, right? Developments in the city of Portland. Can you tell us a little bit about what the committee's been working on? Yeah, so we just had our, I'm trying, I'm like, what month is it? We had, we've only had one meeting because we meet every single month. So we're meeting um, on Tuesday, which I'm really excited about because at our initial meeting, we had conversations around um, like what our priorities are. How can we make sure that we're advocating and supporting the unhoused community? How do we make sure that we're talking about it all the time rather than just uh, this is our January or February focus, but really weaving it into all of the conversations that we have. Um, I'm really excited because we on Monday unanimously voted in support of the HOME program, which is HOPE program, thank you, which is, what's the acronym stand for? Something, something, oh. something encampments. Yep, nope. <laughs> It's the home, home Hope program, and eventually we're gonna figure out what it actually is. It's something something providing for people in encampments, but basically it is getting individuals from encampments into permanent housing. So instead of moving from encampment into shelter, it's from encampment into actual permanent housing because that was a lot of the feedback that we received and a lot of what we talked about too, which is that while it is great to have the option for shelter and while it is still the role of the encampment crisis response team to actually get individuals um, from the encampments into shelter. We know that shelter isn't actually permanent housing, and so being able to actually have the step to support a pilot program that's working to house individuals that are currently um, housing insecure in encampments <clears throat> is a really exciting step that I think that we all unanimously supported, and I think um, is the first time that we have had a pilot of this kind at the city level. And the they're gonna work, I think, to, to try and place, I think, 45 individuals into yeah. into housing um, and we're just really excited to be able to support that within the committee. I think that will be a lot of the conversations that we have is how can we support those efforts? How can we make sure that the encampment uh, crisis response team is still actively working and how do we balance these two things? And then also I think having conversations with members of the public as well about mm -hmm. both of these programs, about what we're trying to do, the weather naturally is going to warm up um, eventually and then that will, uh, I think, create additional encampments as things get warmer. So it's also, what's the protocol now that we have these two programs that are working towards getting mm -hmm. people housed and in shelter? Um, how do we make sure we're addressing barriers that exist at the existing shelter? Because that was a lot of the feedback that we got from the unhoused community as well, was there was 
they didn't want to go into the HSC based on some of the existing barriers there. Mm -hmm. So I think all of this is kind of in this realm of what we're hoping to focus on within the committee. And now that we have four members, um, it's really exciting to be able to, to push more of, of that work forward. Mm -hmm. So this is, sounds to me like kind of the missing piece in terms of what the city uh, has been doing because it's been crisis management. Well, right. the pandemic and then, you know, right after that, then the, the house uh, encampments and so forth. But mm. all the research that I've read uh, indicates that programs that get people into housing, mm. uh, real housing, not, not just emergency shelter, right. Right. and give them the support services to succeed right. there, that those are the programs that really address um, unhoused. Is this gonna build housing or this is just uh, funding to uh, access existing housing? Um, this particular project is just to create um, the positions of three navigators that will exist within the Health and Human Services Department that are specifically working on that trajectory. And so I think uh, a component of that, of course, is if people are unsheltered. I think we um, heard in the meeting um, earlier this week that we have probably about 40 tents still existing in the city of Portland. And so those navigators would be able to work with those who are in tents to try and get them on a trajectory towards housing. And so I think that one of the discussions, you know, that we had and, you know, have gotten feedback from different community partners is, you know, to your point, you know, you need to make sure that you have supportive services if you're getting someone into housing. So just going from a tent right into an apartment might not be successful, but if they're able to do a tent to a transitional space, whether that's mm -hmm. the HSC or one of the other um, other shelters uh, that we have, they may be able to then get on, whether it's medication assisted treatment or mental health services, they're able to now get that continuum of care that's mm -hmm. going to make that a much more sustainable solution. So having the navigators though, and just being able to have someone who can specifically work with that single population is just so important. Um, I had worked within the Maine Med Pediatric Clinic as like an early childhood navigator for parents. Mm -hmm. And you know, once you have a child, all of these things are thrown at you. There's WIC, there's TANF, there's, um, you know, being able to apply for main care and get all these services. And if you don't have someone that can kind of navigate you through that, you know, we, we see it all the time that, you know, the outcomes for the children and the whole family uh, at large are not as good as those who have that support. And so when you add in these additional layers of asylum seekers who are coming that don't get access to those federal programs and they may not be eligible for main care, but their baby was born at Maine Med, so their baby is eligible for main care. But you don't have someone who can just have an interpreter on the phone to be able to go through the WIC process or the main care process. So I think again, having me in that position as a navigator, I was able to, to get parents through some of those barriers. And it's very similar for those, you know, who are existing in our encampments. They might need an ID to be able to apply for housing or to be able to get their housing vouchers. And so now they have um, um, the, oh, what office is it? That, or, um, that helps. So we have, um, I think it's, um, DHS, like mm. DHS is going yeah. to, um, state DHS is going to the HSC yeah. twice a week to be able to help with those applications and getting people identification and being able to, again, help them with that continuum mm. so that they can move into housing. But I think what we're seeing and the reason we're seeing some success is it's not just one stream moves forward, it's really all things. Yeah. You know, we had this HSC that opened in March that by and large was you know, almost entirely the asylum seeking population, mm. which it's not designed for. They have very different needs from language interpretation to being able to make their appointments for asylum at, you know, the uh, asylum court, which if you don't have those supports and services in place, you know, it's kind of non, not functional. I think we saw that and that resulted in a lot of the encampments. But then when we started to create a shelter that was specifically designed and supported mm -hmm. in partnership with community, so not just falling on the city's shoulders, but in partnership with um, the Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition, we start to see some of that movement. And so they were able to get a shelter that was much more um, designed for them. 
um, to be able to have the language services, the job placement services, the court um, supportive services, and then you know be able to have some movement, you know, with the increase in beds at the HSC, to be able to help people, you know, into the shelter for those that you know it was able to to be uh, workable for. But then we start to see the other services can fall into place. And now we can have medication assisted treatment at the HSC so that for the people who are like, I can't go there because I, you know, I still am in active use. So if you cut me off at 8 p.m., I'm going to start to go in withdrawal and, you know, things are not going to be okay. Now we have supports that are going out there to be able to provide that assistance so that that's one of the barriers, as mm -hmm. uh, Tori mentioned, that we're able to overcome, you know, working with, you know, the humane services for people who have pets and working with couples to try and figure out yeah. how can we navigate this to support <laughs> you getting extra storage so that people don't feel like they're losing their belongings. Um, you know, I think the biggest piece still, of course, is the loss in autonomy, mm -hmm. which that's so, so hard. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're able to, again, have more direct work with individuals to help them find what's going to be this right path for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're again, moving all the streams forward instead of just trying to say, well, this one thing is going to work. It's not one thing. It's gonna definitely continue to be a community effort. Didn't the council also vote to um, more permanent, not permanently, but extend quite a bit the 50 extra beds that were yes. added? Yes, yeah, we voted. We, shelter. Yeah, we did that on Monday too. And also it's housing opportunities for people in encampment. Thank you. <laughs> Because I'm really bad with acronyms, and I was like, I, was gonna, I need to know what that is. Be away, get to it. No, I yes, was. Same. I was like, I had it in my brain, and I was like, something, something people. So say it one more time. Housing opportunities for people in encampments, the HOPE program. Cemented. So now it. it is cemented. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we did, we voted to extend um, the 50 beds that are currently in the HSC also on Monday. And I think, like, Councilor Fournier was saying, a lot of pieces are now starting to come together mm -hmm. into this puzzle of what I think we've been working on since last year, yeah. of really trying to make sure we are not just saying like, okay, here's a shelter, go in the shelter, but also receiving the feedback of the shelter has barriers, I can't bring my pet in, I can't stay with my partner. Right. And then now having those conversations. There were some individuals that were saying, the shuttle to and from the shelter is, is like very early and I'm not able to get to it or it's not coming mm -hmm. to a location right. that I'm in. And now those things have been starting to, to be talked about and to be amended. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that was the advocacy of our community partners, mm -hmm. the advocacy of a lot of us on the council who were saying, okay, this is, Helpful. This is a step, but it's still not uh, addressing a lot of the issues that our unhoused community has seen. And I feel uh, enthusiastic and optimistic now, looking at the fact that we have, like I said, expanded or extended the the 50 beds for now. Um, we have the Hope program. We are now again continuing with the encampment crisis response team. We have all of these things in place that we really didn't have last year. Yeah. And I think those conversations we were having last year, it was just sweeping encampments. And a lot of us were like, well, this, but yeah. what else, what are we doing? Right. And so I think now when we can have these things in place, we can hopefully not have to say, well, we have to sweep encampments, there's nothing else to do. We can say, well, we have a lot of programs that are actually working, hopefully, to provide people with shelter mm -hmm. or permanent housing. I feel like what I'm hoping is that we can continue to build this level of trust with our community partners, mm -hmm. but also with the unhoused community directly, who has no reason to trust or be an ally of, of the city, which is inherently, um, oppressive, you know, I think like city government is looking at uh, the systems that are in place and enhancing them. And so if I was somebody that was housing insecure, I'm not gonna like look at the city of Portland and be like, this is gonna be great. Now I feel like because we on the council and community partners and staff have really said, okay, let's let's address some of these barriers and take them seriously and are actually hearing feedback and then making changes. I'm hoping that that will add to some of the trust that we are hoping to build mm -hmm. with a lot of our under-resourced community members. And I think it's gonna take time. I feel like we said that a lot last year with individuals that were wanting immediacy and you know wondering why there were unhoused people everywhere and what, what's gonna happen. And I think it took a year, the HSC hasn't even been open for a whole year. And now I think it's, you know, we're, we're starting to really put things in place, but it's gonna take several years for us to really be like a well-oiled machine working in this way. And um, so I'm looking forward to, to all of that. And I'm, I'm excited for us in the committee to be able to support that work however we can, and hopefully get to hear feedback from the community of saying, oh, this is this is great, I'm excited to hear this. Mm -hmm. I saw you know the article posted about the HOPE program and people were very excited about it. Yeah. It seemed like mm -hmm. they were enthusiastic and 
that felt good because I feel like we never get that. So people were like, oh my gosh, great, good job for the city council. And I feel like we never get that. Um, so that was nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of feedback, I promised you another surprise. Oh, I love it. We often have um, opportunities for the public to pose questions to counselors. We've done it different ways. Yes. Sometimes they come in. Mm. Sometimes we go out in the street and find them. Today, we have a question from a nine-year-old resident of Portland, yes. Gigi. And uh, she has a couple <laughs> questions. They're, they're not really related, but she's going to ask them uh, together. Uh, this was pre-recorded. So, well, Warren, when you're ready, will you roll Gigi's questions? How do we get more local businesses in Portland? Or how do we like local theaters or local shops? Or another one, how do we get more playgrounds? Both good questions. I love it. Great Di questions. Different questions. I love different it. Different questions. Uh, the answers are yes. going to be different. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Sir Fournier, would you like to I, I'll pick one of those? I'm going to start respond? with the playgrounds I know, question. I knew you were going to. <laughs> 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 well, it's fresh in my mind. So actually last night, I'm also a member of the finance committee. And so last night we had our first meeting to review the capital improvements budget or the CIP budget. And so what this is, is these are some more of the, just the, like the, the vehicles or playgrounds or some of the, the um, more concrete infrastructure improvements that we have to make for the city. And so they're really long-term investments. And so some of the things we're, we're talking about that were brought forward by the different departments were like improvements to the Riverton pool, because we know we've had a lot of challenges with that, or, you know, we need to replace one of the vans that goes out to the HSC to make sure that, you know, it's um, able to continue to make those trips um, to go and do all of that. And so one of the things that comes up through Parks and Rec, um, because they oversee all of, of course, the parks uh, in the city, but all of the school playgrounds. And so they are on a they schedule. They oversee the school playgrounds. Yes. Oh, yep. I did not know that. Yeah, and so um, they are constantly looking at when was the last time we replaced this particular playground because playgrounds, I think um, the director said, have a shelf life of between 20 to 30 years, just depending on the materials, the wear, and mm -hmm. kind of where it is in the city. Um, and so they are bringing forward the different playgrounds that are coming up. And so it's not always just the school playgrounds, but it's also some of the neighborhood parks that some of the structures may have you know, fallen into disrepair or um, some of the things just need to be updated. Uh, one of the things we were able to do, um, it was either last year or the year before in the capital improvements budget was actually um, do a fund match for a local skating group, a skateboard group that mm -hmm. had asked for an expansion of the skate park that's right behind uh, Oakhurst. Um, mm -hmm. And so they were able to just grassroots raise all of this money. And then we were able mm -hmm. to match those funds so that we could actually do an expansion of that park. And so it can be it can be something that's brought forward by the city or it's something that absolutely can be brought forward by community partners and just saying, hey, we really want to have a playground in this space, tell us what we need to do. Um, and our parks and rec department can, you know, look at the space and say, so it's going to be, you know, 100,000, 200,000 to do that. If you're able to raise some, we might be able to get this, you know, in our capital improvements budget. And so this probably isn't going to make me popular, but it's always struck sure. me that the Western prom is a lot of grassy parkland, but there's really no playground there. They do now have the carousel of mm, wooden animals, yes. 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 which my two-year-old grandson loves well, <laughs> to play with those. But it has struck me before. I was like, hmm, there's, it's kind of odd that there's not a playground in this. Area. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's yeah. actually, um, I think it, it came out last year or the year before, the Western Prom has a parks plan mm -hmm. um, that the Western Prom Neighborhood Association um, and the Parks Department, um, and I think also Landmarks and the Historic Preservation Group all put together for what is the next 10 years on the Eastern Prom look mm -hmm. like. And so um, you can find that on the city's website. I think the Eastern Prom also has one. Um, but that gives a sense of when this community comes together and talks about this very big space, what is you know the view? And then it gets into some of what's protected land and where do we have to have certain trees, especially for something that has erosion potential. And then, you know, so, so there's definitely a lot that goes into it from a planning perspective. But um, yeah, if people are interested in their park being updated, they can always reach out to the council. And that's something then that we can go to the city manager and say, 
hey, I've gotten some requests to take a look at this park. Um, I had a request, I think it was last year for the Lyman Moore basketball courts because they just felt like it just kept getting overlooked and overlooked. And so that's also something that we yeah. as counselors can advocate for as part of this CIP process, uh, which is happening between now and the end of um, February, the finance committee will vote on it, and then it goes to the full council for discussion okay. and public hearing and all that. So, so Gigi should organize her friends and cousins in the next couple of weeks. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love cool. it. I'll take um, her out for chocolate milk. <laughs> wow, what a deal. Um, do you want to talk about maybe small yeah. businesses like local theaters? Local theaters, mm -hmm. local business. I mean, the great thing I will say about Portland is that we are a melting pot of a lot of really great local businesses. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the best parts about living here is that you can have um, a lot of local options, especially I think being in Maine and being on the water and being in a Portland community that is welcoming of a lot of different um, perspectives and identities and races and ethnicities and cultures, it's really mm -hmm. great to be able to support that. I think it's also really challenging to start a business in Portland and everywhere um, right now. In I think Maine. it's really, in Maine, I just think it's really it's true. it's challenging to start a business anyway, but I think given where we are um, from a financial standpoint as well, it's just, it's a challenging thing to start a business. So I don't wanna say like, oh, it's so easy. You can just move here and start a business. Um, we're lucky that we have some programs that are supportive of people who are either starting businesses or who wanna sustain their businesses. We have grants that we provide for businesses as well through the Community Development Block Grant. Um, so that's really great too, to be able to advocate for a lot of local businesses, especially us counselors. If we meet with businesses and they have really incredible programs and they wanna uplift that, we can try and amplify mm -hmm. that um, ask to the finance committee when they're making their allocations as well. Um, and then I also think that it is tied right into the price of, of living, the cost of living mm -hmm. here as well. So, you know, I, I think it's really challenging and the conversation of opening a business or opening a storefront, I feel like is very similar to trying to find an apartment here mm -hmm. or trying to buy a house here. It's just extremely expensive. And I think that that's across the board mm -hmm. um, nationally. So I'm hopeful that the best way that we can encourage more businesses here is to really continue to support our local businesses as much as we can. Mm -hmm. That's also having fair employee practices within the businesses. That's mm -hmm. also making sure that employers are paying their employees a living wage. It's all, I think, a um, it's all kind of a, a path to really making sure, again, that we're doing what we can to provide and support from a city perspective with mm -hmm. grants and then from a community perspective from shopping local. And instead of going to big box stores, shopping at your local food stores mm -hmm. or your local clothing stores as well to keep these businesses um, sustained. And again, just being able to, to provide and, and support as much as we can and be the welcoming city that I know that we are so that individuals who are looking to start businesses here and who are looking to move here and provide back to the community are feeling welcomed enough to do so. But mm -hmm. it's a very challenging thing. And I think with COVID-19 as well, it really impacted a lot of our businesses and a lot of the people aren't going out the way that they used to anymore. People are ordering more than they're actually leaving their homes. And so I think that's gonna take a lot of recovery for our businesses as well. Mm -hmm. My son was noticing that first Friday was done at 8 p.m. <laughs> last week. He's new to Portland. Oh, yeah. And I think that's just a winter thing. Yes, it yes, is. Yes, yeah. yeah. But, you know, he <laughs> snoozed and he moved. <laughs> he got there and it's like, it's over. There's yeah, well, as, summer as the weather warms. So. Some July, yeah. it's going to be great. Yeah. It'll be happen. It'll be happen. <laughs> well, do you have any closing thoughts that mm. you would like to offer to uh, Gigi or or the viewers in general? We're, we're about two minutes from our Closing thoughts. end. Mm. Um, it's been great hearing more yeah. about positive things. A lot of times yes. we have this show in it. It's you know, I know. The crisis the You're crisis welcome. I know. I was like, you actually came and it's like a little bit more <laughs> positive. I think I'll, I'll just say we're getting feedback via email, um, which is great, but we talked about wanting feedback about the budget. Mm. Um, that's coming up. That vote is coming up. Public comment is always so necessary. It's going to be a really challenging vote as it always is with the budget, city budget and the school budget. So mm. I encourage people to stay involved in that process as okay. much as they can. Okay. Come to the meeting, send us emails um, as well, because of course your, your voice and community input is mm. really necessary during this time with that vote. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would just echo that. Um, show up for public comment, send us you know, public comment ahead of time. And then if you like are really, really interested in getting involved, we have a ton of board and committee positions um, for 
land mm -hmm. bank and planning board mm -hmm. and um, we'll be eventually getting to the police citizen oversight board that was mm -hmm. voted on in the charter and um, the community development block grant. So there's lots of different ways that people can get involved depending on their schedules and what their interests are. And so they can find all of that on the website. And you are so welcoming as counselors yeah. instead of being like, Thanks. Hey, we're out of time. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much to the Portland Media Center, a wonderful tech crew. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you to our wonderful uh, city councilors. Thank you to Gigi. And thank you to our audience at home. We couldn't do it without you. We're here every second Friday of the month. That's from 7 to 7.30. So be well and get involved in local government.